Hello, and thank you for watching today's brief ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. We're going to start with the long range first, and the first time period we're going to examine would be December 20th to January 20th, because we have the new long range weeklies that were released. I noticed a couple of interesting things here. Uh, the heaviest precipitation in the west seems to be on the east facing slopes of the Cascades and the Sierra Nevada. So this would indicate that we're going to get some jet stream flow that will likely do something maybe more like this. And it appears that we could get systems that will eject into the Tennessee and Ohio valleys out of the Mid-South and really cover a big portion of the Midwest. But really when you step back and look at it, we see above average precipitation for a lot of the United States and near normal for the Canadian Prairie. An area that we've been concerned about, staying drier, has been part of the southern and high plains where we've seen drought expand in that area and possibly at times in the southeast. But I do believe we're going to see better precipitation from the southeast to the mid-Atlantic than what you see right here. Now to complement this, let's go quickly over to temperatures and I'm going to show you what we're seeing in terms of those temperatures. So this would indicate we are going to get some colder air that's going to get into place into the west. And therefore we could get some deeper troughs that exist here with time. And if we have a southeastern ridge, that flow pattern just comes right out like this. So it appears that systems will develop late, they'll develop more toward the Midwest rather than right off the Rocky Mountains, and that's why we see the increased precipitation here with the much colder air and the snow on the east-facing slopes. That also may indicate we are losing our strong westerly flow uh, coming off of the jet stream, which as of late has really targeted British Columbia. Okay, the longer term from there stretches into the new European weeklies, which were released on Sunday. And the first map I'm going to show you here is the January, February, March precipitation anomalies. Now, this is really just La Nina to the T. Drier in California, drier in the Great Basin to parts of the Southern Plains and drier along the coast. Very active pattern in through here into the Northeast. Canadian Prairie sees above snow and the Northwest sees above, uh, above average snowfall as well. So the models continue to really allow the La Nina to dominate the pattern. And we're going to kind of call that into question, just ask some questions about not only the temperature pattern, but also the, uh, or excuse me, the precipitation pattern, but also the temperature pattern. I can buy into the mild weather to the south, but I think we're going to see some pretty significant cold air intrusions as we get into the month of, uh, well, end of December, but into January and February. Now that's typical. We do get that, but there's quite a bit of cold air that's stored up into the Alaska right now. And when that cold air is let out, we're going to see some, some major kind of just downshifts in terms of temperature here that are going to really kind of race through the midsection of the United States toward the East Coast. Now our La Nina is peaking and it'll likely keep its peak for a few weeks. It takes a long time for the ocean temperatures to change. So we're gonna see this looking cold like this for a while. We've had some more cold water emerge here. That's actually gonna be really important for Argentina. And I'm gonna cover that in my uh, South American video, which I'm gonna publish next. But the nose of the trade wind still extends about this far out into the Pacific. And it's meeting some westerly winds, giving us a lot of rising motion in, the, in this vicinity. That's, I mean, I've been saying that quite a bit, right? This cold water is critical as well. It's taken the momentum out of the tropics and given us a really zonal jet that's done this. When this La Nina peaks, we're going to see transition in that. And I'm thinking we're starting to get some indications that it's going to start to shift. Because throughout the month of December, the MJO is going to be highly amplified in phase six and move into phase seven. Now, what we don't see over the next 30 days is an aggressive reset coming through phase eight into phase one and two. But it appears that when you get into the month of January, February, and March, that the fading La Nina will allow that to happen. And what this does is this breaks us away from the temperature pattern it just showed you and really starts to introduce more cold air into the eastern two-thirds of the country. That's the big takeaway. So when the La Nina lets go, okay, and those trade winds start to shift back, we're going to start to see those overall shifts. Now, if that ever gets timed up with a polar vortex disruption, then we could see some serious cold air getting to the eastern side of the United States. But right now, the polar vortex is strong, uh, very strong winds. In fact, the polar vortex location is almost over parts of Siberia. And when we look out there at the where it is right now compared to average, see the line right here? It's currently at this position. Average strength would be there. And if it's above average in strength, that means the cold air is really kept tight over Alaska, over the Arctic, over Siberia, and not let out. What we're going to watch for when we get into January and February is a potential disruption. There usually is something that comes along and gives us some stratospheric warming that can displace that, but nothing in the near term. All right. 
So from there, what have we got? Well, we had a big front that swept through the country today behind a low pressure center that's now coming out of Ontario into Quebec. And that's the one that gave us the winter storm warnings that put down quite a bit of snow in this area and has introduced today very strong winds that raced across the Great Lakes out of the northwest. And that got all the way down to Texas here. When we look back over the last 72 hours of total accumulated precipitation, some places here saw quite a bit of heavy rainfall. Uh, you can see we had some storms this morning and through here, and they stretched all the way down into the lower Mississippi River Valley. And this front is just moving its way over toward the east tonight. All of this was snow in the backside here. And we can take a look at that, or first time, sorry, let's go here. Let's take a look at that snow on satellite. I'll come back to that graphic in a minute here. You can see on satellite, there it is, there's some of that snow that's in place right in through here. That's the white that's not moving on the ground. And we look back at those uh, numbers across the country. Uh, there were some places in here that picked up between 6 and 12 inches of snow. Well, we're going to get some lake effect on the back side of this as it moves forward. But warm air is returning to this area, so some of that snow is going to melt. Now, before I come back to that graphic I accidentally clicked on there, I want to get to a near-term forecast. And we'll finish with that one, okay? So where this La Nina is going is what that graphic was about. So here we go. Next 10 days. We've got... A shift farther to the south of the jet stream and the flow at times once we get out here is going to start to come out of the southwest it's not the subtropical jet but it's a deep trough and that's what's going to increase the precipitation in California watching a low on Friday emerge here and go toward the Great Lakes it's going to bring snow into an area right into this region and we're going to watch storms out ahead of it okay problem is is that this region in through here seems to get left in a dry slot and that's why we see drier conditions continue in an area that's been quite dry. To watch it all unfold, let's do our multi-model analysis. So first system moves through Quebec tonight and is offshore. And it just dragged a front here. You can see on the GFS model, drag the front here. And by tomorrow morning, it's already offshore. Model's got the same position. Light snow possible here in the central plains getting into the upper Midwest. And some lake effect coming on the backside of that low. Across the west, largely a disorganized system coming through there on Tuesday. And we're going to watch middle of this week. There's another clipper by Wednesday emerging here. It's in both models. We can see that clipper coming in into parts of Saskatchewan and eventually into Manitoba. And while that's occurring, there could be a coastal low that's developing. But at this point, it seems to be pretty far offshore, meaning some snow showers in the interior of New England. But that seems to be about it. As we play forward from Thursday getting into Friday, this is where I'm starting to watch the next uh, series of low pressure systems kind of move across the country. If I go back Thursday into Friday, there's the lead wave in the GFS. It's also there in the European. But already the GFS is getting to be more progressive and quicker than the European. And we see that on Friday morning, about 6 a.m., this low emerges in Colorado and then moves pretty quickly throughout the day on Friday into Saturday here toward, well, the GFS is much slower than the European, which keeps the low here in the European. The GFS is already farther into Wisconsin. So you see how the progressive pattern is moving there? Well, what I want to show you is that on Friday into Saturday, there's going to be a corridor in through here that I'm going to watch for the potential for some strong to severe storms. So there's getting into Saturday, and that heavier rain moves to the east. Now, one anomalous thing that has really shown up in the GFS model is as you get out there towards Sunday morning, it introduced a lot of cold air in the 12Z run and brought in some heavy snow. We got to call this into question because it's one model run that's doing this and it's not in the European. All right, I'll show you more evidence of that in a second. But that system moves on out and look at the difference here. As we get out here toward early next week, that flow dips down, targets California, really increasing the precipitation there. It's in both models. But the models on the East Coast couldn't be more out of alignment. The GFS is planning a big area of high pressure here. And the Europeans got a weak cutoff low in the upper levels of the atmosphere. So we need to stop here with these operational runs and rely on the ensembles, which we'll do in just a second. But I'm going to stitch it together for you at least. This is the next seven days according to the um, European. So better flow into the northwest, bring in some snow into the Great Basin, into the central Rockies. And this is the snow swath in through here. Heavy rains in the southeast, and it all pulls in to the northeast, eastern Ontario, and Quebec. What's the GFS say? Very similar. I mean, you can't argue that they found the same features through the next week. But there are differences, and I like to map those out. So the GFS much more aggressive on that second system late this weekend and through this area. Whereas the European overall is a wetter model. The GFS has more snow farther to the north here than the European does there. And again, these colors are where the European's wetter, 
These are where the GFS is wetter. The European much wetter in the southeast. Okay, so just, just some model comparison there. Putting it together in terms of snow, look at the differences between the models. Let's focus first of all on the snow track right in through here from the low that emerges on Friday and gets here by Saturday. How a heavy snow corridor kind of coming through uh, parts of Nebraska, clipping around Sioux Falls, western Iowa, southern Minnesota, straight here, almost to one of my favorite towns in the country, Minocqua, Wisconsin, right there. This is what the uh, the GFS says. So see how the storm, the snow tracks a little farther to the north. Okay, let's go back and come back to the GFS. Now on the GFS, this is all the stuff I am calling into question, and I'll tell you why in a second. But before I do anything else. The Sierra Nevada, the Cascades, we're piling up some snow here. Both models agree on that. That's that stronger onshore flow that we're going to get in the near term, which we're, I'm pretty excited about. But over there along, uh, let's come back here, sorry. There we go. The next seven days, you see how the European Ensemble is not aggressive on the heavy snows here behind that last system. So I think this is our main snow corridor outside of the bigger stuff that's going to come into eastern Ontario over into Quebec, and then of course the stronger flow here into the west, piling up the snow in the Sierra Nevada, the Rockies, and the Cascades. So I, I rely more on this map, which again, I'm sorry, shows you the probability of getting three inches of snow over the next seven days, more than I would on the individual snow maps. All right, from there, let's talk about the pattern getting into week two, because this is an interesting setup. This is really to almost textbook MJO phase seven, ridge here, trough sticking into the west and a pattern like that keeps above average precipitation here but i'm telling you there's going to be an active corridor in through here as well from the mid-south parts of the you know parts of the western corn belt missouri um bringing systems through that area we're going to see that and i believe the models are overly dry in this whole part of the east coast i think they're overly dry into week two and just to kind of give some evidence of where this temperature pattern is going to go as we finish this up you know, Monday's highs brutally cold in the northern plains. What a switch, right? Last, what was it, Wednesday, we were in the 70s here. We've had over a 60-degree swing in temperatures. Well, the temperature swing is going to continue. Tuesday, that cold air moves east. But by Wednesday into Thursday, look at the rebound of warmth in the midsection of the country. But you know a system's emerging on Friday in Colorado, so there's going to be cooler air on the backside of that. That's where we get our snowfall into this area. And that warmer air expands into this region on Friday and Saturday. That's the risk of the strongest of your storms. But that also moves east by Saturday getting into Sunday. But overall, in the longer term, we don't yet have the right pieces in place to break down the ridge and develop lots of cold air that can move out. So what we end up getting here is day 5 through 10. That would be this Friday through the middle of next week. More mild air returns, melting all that snow that could fall in this area. And it's even out there day 10 through 15 when the ridge is established over the southeast. But we need to watch this cold air coming out because it's there and it's poised for the second half of this month. And we saw it coming out when we began this forecast video talking about what we're expecting for that time period of late December through late January. Now back to that graphic I snuck in there a few moments ago. Where was it? Right here. This would be what we're forecasting the La Nina to do. By January, it's making the turn. Into February, March, April, we expect it to get back to neutral territory. Possibly by early summer, we could be looking at a weak El Nino event occurring. That's what the models are suggesting. You can see it in the ocean temperatures. Coldest in December. By January, the fade is beginning. Getting into February, March, April, May, and June. And at this point, this is a very peculiar view of the ocean temperatures. There's the cooler water here. Warmer water is emerging, but there's still cool water along the west coast of the Gulf of Alaska. I found a couple of analog years for this, and I'm just going to give you the years, but I don't want you to give them any weight. The first was the winter of 2017 into 2018. We saw the same thing happening by spring. And the second was the winter of 2011 into 2012. We actually saw the same thing happening going into spring. You want to know the difference, though? By the time we got into summer in 2018, the ridge set up here. In 2012, the ridge set up there, which means I don't want you to give this any thought as to what the strongest analogs are right now, because the summer transition is just not known yet. And I'll just keep watching it, and I'll keep analyzing it and report back to you. Appreciate your attention. We'll talk to you again on Thursday. Thank you.